My name is Arielle and I'm the music director at Zero Hour. And over the past few months, I've been working on writing a song called We Rise along with my amazing team members, Andrea Manning, Laís Santoro, Gabrielle Zui, Corey Malia, Iris San, and Kendall Kiras. We've been putting together a video with activists from across the country and we can't wait to share it with you right now. Our house is burning down, can you see through our eyes? They say we're doing fine, but we see through the lies. We wade through the water, walk through the fire, we're just trying to survive. But we want to thrive, we can't keep on sitting by. We rise for our future, we sing. honor to be here. I'm so excited to speak with you guys. We were just chatting earlier, um, getting to know each other a little bit. And so, like Jordan said, you're both climate activists um, and leaders in the climate movement in LA. And so I was wondering if you could just, I would love to hear from you guys a little bit about what led you to become involved in the climate justice movement and the work that you each do as activists. Um, Sarah, did you want to go first? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so I think of myself as coming from a pretty privileged place because I was able to learn about the climate crisis and not experience, experience the effects of it firsthand. Um, and in like middle school and early high school, it was something that was always spoken about in the abstract. I always heard it as in people far away happening in the future and nothing I could really do about it. So I wasn't really compelled to get involved then, but um, March of 2019 is when that changed for me. I was just at school one day, wasn't thinking anything was happening. Um, and my friend came up to me and said, hey, do you wanna go to this climate strike? Um, like at snack that day. And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and I called my mom and I was like, let me leave school. And I don't know why she let me do it. If I was her, I wouldn't have. Um, but I just got in this car and I went to this climate strike. And 
that's where something really changed inside of me. I heard the stories of people on the front lines of the climate crisis really experiencing what's going on. And I really learned about climate justice, just listening to those speakers. And I just kind of realized this is not something that's happening in the future. It's not something that's happening to people far away. It's happening right now to people in Los Angeles and across the world, but um, it really changed me to learn about those things, um, listening to the speakers at that strike. And so I just decided that, you know, I'm not going to sit back and just let myself go throughout life without doing anything, without trying to combat this issue. So um, through that experience, I just started showing up to every single event that Youth Climate Strike held. And by the fall of 2019, I had become a core organizer and I was organizing strikes with um, with them and I got involved with CA Youth versus Big Oil and One Up Action and the Earth Day Movement LA Coalition. So that's kind of the work that I've been doing. That's amazing. And B, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement? Yeah, so um, I guess I've always kind of been in the activism field ever since I was little, right? Um, it started off probably when I was about maybe in first grade and um, my school tried to, or my school district, LUSD tried to cut funding for buses. Um, so that's, you know, one thing that we started tackling as, you know, as early as I could remember. Um, and then soon from there, you know, just growing up with my mom, um, I had a young mother, so she was always going to school. So I was always surrounded uh, by, you know, whatever she learned about, you know, the environment or just kind of social and climate issues. Um, so, it's, you know, I've always been surrounded by it, you know, and then um, I grew growing up, I lived by a uh, freeway. So I always had health issues growing up. Um, but, you know, there, I think the specific point as to when I really started getting involved was um, after I had severe depression in high school, um, I didn't really know like how to move forward with my life. And so, you know, at that moment, I just started reconnecting with my culture and there was just this flooded passion that I felt for my community. And so the more I got to connect with my community, the more that I learned about, you know, the injustices that we faced, um, you know, a lot of my aunties, a lot of my relatives, they ended up going to Standing Rock at the time. Uh, so I think that was another motivation for me to really fight for my community in any way that I could. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think, like you said, it's easy to feel super overwhelmed and view climate change as this thing that's way too large for any singular person to tackle. Um, you know, there's solutions like recycling or eliminating plastic use that seem so minuscule. Um, how do you fight against this sentiment of helplessness and really take action that is meaningful in your community and beyond your community, right? Like not just within LA, but um, beyond LA. And how, maybe if you have any tips from your experience, like how are you able to remain committed to environmental activism just in your day to day? Um, well, first I'd like to acknowledge my privilege um, to even know that I have a voice, right? Um, and I know I was always told that, you know, I have a voice and I'm very fortunate for growing up with a mom who taught me that. Um, and, you know, I'm very also privileged to have a platform that I can speak on. And so I don't think I've ever really felt helpless because I know that through my platform, I can keep the door open and invite more people to talk and bring in more um, people to really share their experiences. Um, but I think uh, burnout is very real. Um, so it's important that you take care of yourself through this time too, and make sure that you don't overwhelm yourself as well. So do you have any, like, do you, when do you know that you need to sort of take a step back for yourself so you don't reach that point of burnout? Um, I think it's having a very fluid team. So I, I'm very fortunate enough to have a team. Uh, I'm from the International Indigenous Youth Council from the LA chapter. And there's about, you know, five of us now. Um, but, you know, before then, there was probably about three of us. So I, you know, was able to share that work with others. Um, and having that clear communication really helped, you know, but I think joining an organization or a nonprofit or anything of that sort would really help too. Mm, definitely. Community, I feel like, is everything. And it's at the heart 
of you know the climate justice movement, social justice movement. Um, Sarah, would you like to share with us? Um, yeah, I one of the most valuable things I have gained from being an activist is definitely that community and finding the people that I really connect with. Um, it's really wonderful to um, be able to connect with people who share your passion. Um, but I also do know that feeling of just being so hopeless and overwhelmed um, when looking at the broad issues that relate to the climate. And I think for me, um, the more I did my research and learned about different issues um, regarding the environment, the, the more you find um, different ways that you can get involved personally in your day-to-day -day life and just really understanding the complex complexities of what's going on, it can make it seem more hopeless and more like difficult to deal with, but you find like, I didn't know anything about the fast fashion industry um, a year ago and I did my research and I was like, oh wow, like probably shouldn't shop at H&M anymore. And um, now I don't and it makes me feel better that even that tiny act of just not choosing not to shop at one place um, really makes a huge impact. And so the more you do your research and even attending this panel, that's step one, you're coming here and you're making an active effort to um, learn and finding and you can find community here and in other places so just the more you get involved the more ways that you can find to get involved and it'll make you feel better that you're doing something yeah that's that's great advice um we've now been living in a global pandemic for six months and many communities of colors are especially threatened um due to one of many things, but environmental racism and the systemic um, racism also in the healthcare system. And so I was wondering if you guys can explain a few of the many ways that communities of color are disproportionately affected by the need um, for climate justice. And I think specifically for B, how has your advocacy for indigenous communities um, relate to your climate justice activism? Yeah, so um, I know Sarah has a lot of uh, really great information on uh, California oil drilling. And so I really like her to speak on that first. Oh, okay. sure. Um, well, <laughs> uh, well, I do work with California Youth versus Big Oil and I really encourage everyone to look up the Last Chance Alliance and learn about that work more. Um, but it's really, um, so our main goal is to phase out fossil fuel infrastructure in California. And we're really targeting the government to make that happen. But the, the way it relates to um, communities of color and environmental racism is because people of color make up 92% of the people living within a mile of an oil drill. So it's very, very clearly disproportionately targeting low income communities of color, which I find to just be absolutely disgusting that in my own state where we're seen as this progressive champion of like climate change and environmental policy as California, we're really not doing um, all that we can to protect our communities and to fight the climate crisis. We are a huge producer of oil and it's not just an oil issue, it's really a community health risk. When you live near these oil fields, there's higher risk of reproductive issues, of respiratory issues, higher cancer risk. And there are plenty of frontline youth out there and frontline people. And you can um, go on the Last Chance Science website and hear their stories. Um, and that, like I was talking about before, hearing those stories, you can't just sit back and be silent about it anymore. It's really something I felt compelled to speak up on. And relating it back to COVID, um, when you live near these oil fields, as I said, you get upper respiratory issues, asthma, and it puts you at a higher risk for contracting the coronavirus. And so these, these communities are being systematically targeted by our government. And it's really something that needs to change. And that's why I do this work with CA Youth versus Big Oil. And there are petitions you can sign and sign in ways you can get involved that I can talk a little bit more about later. Yeah. Do you share any of this stuff on your social media? I feel like people should go and follow you and so that they can have access to these resources. I think that's the beauty as well of, you know, we have so much access now um, with everything really living in a digital space. Um, but yeah, that's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
And B, do you have, do you, would you like to add anything? Yeah. So, um, once again, I'd like to acknowledge the privilege of, that I have, um, you know, living in the neighborhood where I do now. Um, I currently reside in Tongva territory uh, by Hahamanga, which is also known as Pasadena. Um, and so, you know, in the indigenous community, we have um, a lot of like disparities that range. Uh, so, you know, you can live in the city and face, you know, a lot of like pollution from brewways. You can face a lot of like, you know, boil water advisories. Um, but I think the biggest thing, though, in our community is facing uh, pipelines. Um, you know, we are seeing that the government does not follow treaty rights um, and does not obey, you know, what the tribe requests. Um, and so there's a lot of also companies that, you know, will partner with the government um, that we see happening. And so not only are we fighting COVID, but we are also fighting another um, ep epidemic, um, <laughs> another issue with our missing and murdered indigenous women. Mm. Um, and so pretty much what that is, is, uh, you know, we have um, these pipelines being built on territories. And from that moment, um, you know, we see that our treaty rights are being violated, not only that, but um, the reservation rights as well. Oftentimes, you know, I believe it's 80% of non-Indigenous um, men uh, are the cases of um, our missing and murdered Indigenous women. And so unfortunately what happens is that, you know, they'll um, come onto the reservation, they'll harm our women, um, and then they, you know, will go back to the States because technically we do have sovereign land. Um, mm. And so it's, it's a bit of a, a tricky situation with jurisdiction, however, but, um, Unfortunately, you know, oftentimes we're not only facing, you know, the issues between laws, but also the issues between racism as well. And so, um, you know, right now we're having a really big issue, you know, not only with COVID, but also, you know, unfortunately having our relatives go missing. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, it's really at that intersection and with the evidence of climate change being absolutely undeniable, the disproportionate impact of climate change on women and girls is often like way too overlooked. Um, what steps are needed to better recognize the intersection of gender and climate justice? And how can we develop solutions to combat climate change through the lens of gender and through this intersectionality that um, cannot be siloed? So personally, um, this is uh, from what I've reflected after talking to um, my aunties and my uncles about this. Um, I cannot speak for other people and how they express their genders. Um, but for me, you know, I identify as both, um, you know, female, male, um, and everything in between. And I feel like my gender is expressed um, through the land. You know, traditionally, as Indigenous people, um, you know, our gender kind of gave us these roles. And I feel like because we imitated what we saw, you know, in, in our environment, that we therefore had these roles kind of given to us um, and, you know, that we learned from. And, you know, we, that's not to say that, you know, we, you know, women would only cook and women would only do this. But, you know, traditionally in my nation, we were matriarchs. And so we had these, you know, governing societies that were fluid back and forth in between where you could go. And so I feel like gender for me is, you know, the role that I have in my community as a matriarch. And I feel that I rather not connect myself, you know, to the societal gender roles that we have now, but rather to um, imitating the land and imitating, you know, my relatives and my aunties. Um, but, you know, when you think about it, like, in my perspective, um, gender is balance, you know, and I, try to reflect that, you know, it goes the same as the land being in balance. And mm -hmm. so um, when I think about, you know, the disproportions and um, the disparities of, you know, seeing uh, women of color and just women in general in these um, higher positions, it makes me feel like um, we need to establish those matriarch systems again. And we need to figure out how we can make our, um, I guess you would call governing systems, um, a more circular rather than hierarchical. Absolutely, we we need to establish those matriarchal systems. Um, Sarah, do you have anything to add? Yeah, and thank you so much for that, B. That was really insightful. Um, the way I see it, and the way that the climate change issue is um, at its very core, is 
humans dominating the earth and putting themselves above the earth and the environment. And that's something that really, really needs to change. We need to stop seeing ourselves as above and more put ourselves in harmony with the earth. And every single system that's a supremacy similar to that needs to be challenged and combated in order to really um, get to that harmony. And the patriarchy is something that is falls within that category. And it's really unfortunate that the Western patriarchal worldview is what has become dominant right now. And, you know, it relates back to what B was talking about with the missing and murdered Indigenous women. We can't have this worldview where some people are above others. And I'd like to touch on a little bit um, like women in developing countries, because this is a really concrete example of how women's advancement is directly correlated to the advancement of our earth and our society as a whole. And so it's really, it's been proven that when women have greater reproductive freedom, educational opportunities, career opportunities, um, they have fewer children and that means fewer people that we have to put resources into. Um, and so when we, we are at a population crisis right now, um, and so we really need to work towards the advancement of women, especially in Africa and Asia and developing countries where they don't have the same opportunities that we have and often have to have a lot of children. Um, and that's just what's expected of them. And so just changing that worldview of women being lesser and giving women the opportunities to become leaders, to have careers is really going to help our environment as a whole. Yeah, in that's, incredible that you bring that up in the drawdown book that um, presented solutions to combat climate change um, by 2050. Um, educating young women and girls was number six to fighting climate change. And so I think that's something that definitely needs emphasis. Um, and sort of in, in, in talking about that, um, how do you view your role within the larger sort of climate justice movement? What do you hope to accomplish before this year ends? There's six, seven months left. Um, how, how do you view your role within this larger movement? Yeah, as, um, as a woman of color, um, I'm Middle Eastern and those my face isn't seen very often in leadership positions in general, like a Middle Eastern woman in an American position isn't very common. And so I kind of view myself being in leadership positions as an act of rebellion in itself. And I really hope that me using my voice and being here and having a platform is going to help inspire other women of color to speak out and use their voice because, um, it really is necessary for women and our voices to be heard, especially within the climate movement, um, because as we talked about before, it really is a women's issue and we need to be focusing on women's advancement in every solution that we pr present forward. And so, I mean, what I really hope to accomplish is um, through one of action, I really hope to grow that organization and to um, create chapters all over the world that can do the things that we're talking about that could help with women's advancement and to tackle climate solutions on a local level. And B, what about you? Um, I'm still trying to, you know, exactly decide where I see myself. Um, I do hope to be able to connect to network and connect more um, and be able to really share the platform that I have with others. But also I feel like um, this is also a time where I need to kind of go inward um, and really start learning about myself and, um, you know, building that connection with Nikotsan, um, Mother Earth. And so I, you know, I've been <laughs> doing this work for a pretty long time, like I said. Um, and so it's also important to remember that rust is resistance. You know, we can't be pushing ourselves 100%. And, uh, you know, we need to really make sure that we don't have that burnout. So, you know, it goes back and forth between doing more work, but at the same time, holding that balance of making sure that we're taking care of ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, today you, you're speaking to hundreds of young women and girls who can all contribute to the climate justice movement. Um, 
I would love to hear what, if there are any actionable steps that um, you would like our audience members to take in order to collective, collectively combat climate change. You know, Sarah, I know you mentioned there are petitions to, to be signed. Um, if there are any resources or actionable items, um, I think that sometimes that really helps with getting people involved is there might be a lot of stuff where for somebody who isn't in the movement, it feels overwhelming because they don't really know where to start. So if you guys have any sort of pinpointers or tips as to where to start to be involved um, and to join the movement and have more people, because the goal is that this is everybody's movement, right? Like nobody uh, shouldn't be a part of this. Everybody needs to be involved. Yeah, I think the first thing that is really important for everyone to realize who isn't a part of the movement but wants to be is that your passion at, for this work and your time is enough. You don't have to be the most researched, informed person in the world. You don't have to be anything special to get involved and to have your voice be heard and for it to be worthy. I think it's really easy to see these huge climate activists and think that they have something that you don't and that you're not good enough in some way. And so I just really wanna emphasize first off that your voice is good enough and we need your voice in this movement. Um, and yeah, as far as getting involved, I think just find anything that is interests you and that you're passionate about and just apply for whatever position it is or sign every um, petition you can find. And once you do that, if you get involved in however, however you can, wherever you can, you will find your place where you really fit in and where you can make the most impact. I mean, step um i would like you to apply to start a one-up action chapter or apply to be on our executive team if that's something you want to do or you can do that with every any other organization um you could follow me on instagram i'm always posting stuff you can follow other activists on instagram and you will find those opportunities so i think just do your research and just find these organizations where you can get involved because there are so many opportunities. And what I found is that there are so many activists doing so much and we need more people involved and we need more voices in this movement. And so wherever you're at, like education wise or like however old you are, um, what resources you have, it doesn't matter. We need your voice. So please, please just get involved because it, you will be so valued in this movement. It's so important that we have as many voices as possible. Yeah, and um, I would just like to say that, you know, leading on to Sarah's points, too, is that, you know, it's also very important that, like, you understand how important you are in this movement. You know, it's important to educate yourself. It's important to understand that whatever you do now, that it, it, it does have an impact, you know. And so, like Sarah said, get involved with these organizations. I have been very privileged to be able to speak on these different platforms with other folks because I have joined an organization and I've only been here for a few months. So, you know, it, it it's really about finding and connecting with community. And, you know, back to, you know, educating yourself and understanding that you have these roles. It's also important to remember to rest. You know, we can't be pushing ourselves, like I said earlier. At the same time, you know, if you're passionate, that's great and you can use that. And so just be sure to connect with others and even on social media too. Um, I follow a lot of great people like Indigenous United Seeding Sovereignty. Melanin Muskogee is a really amazing person um, just to drop some handles. But yeah, just be sure to really connect with your community and there's always work to do and there always will be work to do as well. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's always something for you. Yeah, thank you guys. That was That was really insightful. I feel like, like you said, Sarah, as a Palestinian Lebanese woman, I also am very passionate about Middle Eastern representation and having um, Arab women like ourselves be in leading and executive roles and be, you know, I really resonate with what you said about gender being about balance. And it's the same thing with the land. It's the same thing with any movement. It's really about balance. So getting involved and really getting into the work, but also making sure that we're taking care of ourselves and resting. And I absolutely loved speaking with you guys. Um, I'm That's it for our questions. I'm wondering if there's anything else that you would like to share with our audience um, today. 
Yeah, so um, just want to remind y'all uh, to follow IIYC family, um, IIYCLA, and all our different chapters. Uh, support Black and Brown business, Black Lives Matter, all Black Lives Matter. And uh, yeah, be sure to take care of yourselves. Yeah, I just want to echo everything B just said. You put it, you put it simply, but it's the best way to do it. Um, if you want to get involved in anything that I'm doing, you can follow One Up Action. Um, there's a ton of resources on that page, and yeah, just please do your research, stay informed, and get involved in any way you can because we really need your voice in this movement. Thank you guys so much, and everybody, go follow B and Sarah on social media. We'll also make sure to give them a shout out on Slow Factory, where we're always making sure to center Black, Brown, and Indigenous and minority ethnic voices. That's really the heart of these movements. Um, and thank you guys so much for giving me your time and sharing your work and a little bit about yourselves with everybody today. Um, I love this conversation and I hope we can stay in touch and speak again soon. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm back. You couldn't hear me earlier, but I'm back to tell you a little bit about day two. First of all, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you so much to our incredible climate panel. Um, those women are really making change in their communities and we are so excited to have them join us today. So thank you all, um, Yasmin, B, and Sarah. We really, really appreciate you joining us and talking a little bit about your incredible work. So we hope you all had a great time yesterday. Really wanna thank our speakers who joined us yesterday, um, the ones who've already spoken today, as well as our fabulous breakout leads who led sessions yesterday. I know I learned so much, I hope you did too. I also want to make sure that we thank our sponsors for whom without this wouldn't with this would never be possible without them. Our incredible producers at Happily, our sponsors at L'Oreal Paris, the California Women's Foundation, and the California Endowment, as well as our more than 50 incredible community partners that you can find right on our website at unitedstateofwomen.org backslash youth. Those organizations are working on gender equity for women and girls, particularly for young women and girls across the country right now. And they are doing some work that is really, really inspiring and I hope you can get involved with them. While you're on our website looking at our partners, if you haven't done so already, make sure to register for one of our breakouts happening today. We have tons of really, really great sessions that are being led by youth leaders where you can learn more about how you can get involved in a whole host of different issues. You can register for those on our website until 2 p.m. Eastern, and we hope that you really um, get into those, meet new people, um, and start to build some connections for work that you can do in the future. And now I'm really pleased to introduce our next uh, speaker, Mira Dasgupta, who is the 2020 United States Youth Poet Laureate and the youngest United States Youth Poet, Poet Laureate that has ever been at 16 years old. We're so inspired by her work and her voice, and we hope that you will, will be too. So really enjoy your day. Thanks so much for coming, and we'll talk soon. Hi, my name is Mira Dasgupta, and I am a 16-year-old girl be heard active performer and the 2020 United States Youth Poet Laureate with Urban Word NYC and the National Youth Poet Laureate Program. So I just wanted to make space for the fact that these are very strange times that we're finding ourselves in. And so many people are experiencing the world in a multitude of ways. But I just want you to remember that no matter how isolating this must all feel, we are still very much united. And the one thing that 2020 hasn't changed is the power of the youth voice. You've already taken the first step by just being here, but I just want you to put yourselves out there and to explore your passions within your advocacy, whether it be through spoken word poetry, artivism, or social media. Know that you and your words are of value. You can make a tangible change within the world. Thank you for listening and having me here. I can't wait to see what all of you do in the future.
Hello, 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 United State of Young Women. It is such an honor to be with you today. My name is Althea Lawton Thompson, and I'm the owner of AYM Fitness. AYM is a corporate wellness company based in Atlanta, Georgia, and my instructors and I provide mind-body classes to companies based here in Georgia. But I'm also the leader of Living Life Limitlessly Healing Retreats, where I host retreats around the world for women to do yoga, Pilates, meditation, and just explore in places like South Africa, Bali, Costa Rica, and all throughout the United States and the Caribbean. But today, I'm representing one of my favorite organizations in the whole world, GirlTrek.org. I have been walking with Girl Trek and leading hikes all throughout the United States since 2015, and we are teaching women how to radically love themselves through walking and exercising, women and girls. So go check us out, girltrek.org. With Girl Trek, I am one of the chief meditation engineers. I just made that up, but we'll go with it. I'm a chief meditation engineer, and that means that I guide meditation not only for the 800,000 black women around the country that walk with Girl Trek, but for you and for everybody else that's open to self-love. Let's start our meditation by taking a deep breath in and stretching the spine up and lifting the face toward the ceiling or the sky. As you exhale, relax the shoulders and drop the chin toward your chest. Let go, don't try. Repeat that movement, breathing in, lifting up, And as you exhale, letting go, releasing, accepting the moment as it is. Go at your own pace. There's no such thing as right or wrong when it comes to our pace of breathing and how we're moving. Take a deep breath in, arching the back, chest out, face up, fill the lungs and return to center, bringing the hands together at your heart. Be still, breathe, be quiet. Recognize the feel of one fingertip against the other. Pay attention to how the palms feel connected Right now, come up with one positive affirmation or phrase about yourself. Think about it. What do you do well? What are you known for? What are you proud of? I am fill in the blank. Use encouraging words like, I am strong. I am wise. I am smart, I am graceful, I am powerful, I am a leader. With your word, your phrase, your affirmation in mind, slowly extend the fingertips toward me. Open your palms, extend them out to the sides, stretch the chest open, breathe in. Then slowly bring the arms back together, the hands together, and bring it into your heart. This time, say it out loud. I am an open wide. This time, we're going to incorporate our breath. I am and breathe in deep. Fill the lungs. As you exhale, I am. Say it like you mean it and bring it into your heart. Continue to move, thinking of different words. I am strong, I'm wise, I'm powerful, I am a leader, I'm graceful, I'm beautiful.
I am the one I have been waiting for. You're saying it to everybody else that's meditating with us right now. You are wise, strong, beautiful, powerful. And as you bring your hands together, receive all of those powerful words that were just given. Be still, sit with it in your palms, at your heart, in your mind. And now it's time for gratitude. I want you to imagine as many things as you can that you're grateful for. It can be people, things, places, experiences, circumstances, or even the dreams that you have for what's to come. With that in mind, extend your hands upward powerfully open wide stretch your fingertips to the corners of the ceiling or the sky and then as you bring your hands back together accept that thing for which you are grateful right back into your heart bring it into your spirit One more, one more. Say it like you mean it, stretch through like you've got this. Breathe on it and bring it in with appreciation. You've been chosen, you are the one. Say it, believe it, receive it. Be still with that. In these final moments of silence, I want you to create an intention. Decide in this very moment how you're going to continue to show up from here on out. How are you going to act? How are you going to react? How are you going to interact? Right now, be still, close your eyes and decide who are you going to be as you move into leadership today tomorrow and all the tomorrows to come. Thank you for meditating with me. Thank you for giving me just a few minutes of your day. And thank you to the United State of Young Women for allowing me to be a part in inviting Girl Trek into your world. Visit us at girltrek.org to learn how more than 800,000 black women and girls are walking to take back their communities, our lives, and our health. You can also learn more about me, Althea Lawton Thompson, at AltheaLawtonThompson.com and here are links to all of my social media. Until our paths cross again, peace, light, love. Listen to the singles morning meditation and sleepy time meditation from my best-selling album Guided Meditations with Althea.
We see it happen everywhere at any time. 78% of women have experienced sexual harassment in public spaces. Like a suggestive comment, a sexually explicit touch, an inappropriate gesture, or being followed. And it threatens our self-worth. It takes over who we are. We see it happen, but stay cautiously silent and uncomfortably look away. Maybe because we don't know what to do, how to help, or how to combat the situation. I said I'm fine, so don't bother me. The time has come to keep our heads up and to stand up for each other against street harassment. And everyone can be part of the solution. Sorry, I'm going to pay for it. Excuse me? Is this yours? Can you help me, please? <laughs> I'm looking for this direction. L'Oreal Paris and the nonprofit organization Holla Back have joined forces to teach men and women how to combat sexual harassment in public spaces with simple but impactful actions. Because we are all worth it. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here again. Again, I'm Jordan Brooks. I'm the Executive Director of the United States of Women. And I am here um, to talk to you a little bit about our exciting stuff that's happening uh, the rest of the couple, next couple of days. But first, I want to introduce my colleague um, and really just social media and communications guru at the United States of Women, Ruthie Cooney. Ruthie, welcome to the United States of Young Women. Thank you so much, Jordan. I'm so excited to be here. Hi, mom. <laughs> It's so great to be here um, with everybody. Thank you for introing me. Again, I'm the Communications Associate for the United States of Women, and I'm really proud to be here today. Thanks, Ruthie. So I know, first of all and foremost, if anybody, just a couple of housekeeping notes that Ruthie will give you in a second, but if anybody is not signed up for our feminist to-do list, every other week, Ruthie and her incredible team write an action-oriented newsletter. So Ruthie, you wanna tell us a little bit about the feminist to-do list? Boy, do I ever. I love the feminist to-do list. Um, it's an action-oriented newsletter. Um, it's sort of, it's written, um, consider us your feminist older sisters. You know, if you're, if you're not really familiar with how to navigate um, the World Wide Web with respect to gender equity, we're here for you. And so we bring you um, everything you need to know and ways you can take action because we know that it can be very overwhelming to, um, you know, process the news cycle and um, we want to give you ways to take action about the news that you're hearing and um, sort of from everything from pop culture to like I said like breaking news that's what we're bringing to you and want to give you a way to feel like you're contributing to that space as well so we think it's really we think it's a great newsletter we think it's really fun and you all should go and subscribe you can go to bit.ly slash feminist letter to subscribe or the united state of women.org slash newsletter um it's bi-weekly and again like i've said a thousand times it's action oriented because we know that's so important it can be um overwhelming and sometimes i know i feel a little bit helpless when i'm reading article after article and um I want to. I want to contribute. I want to join the fight, and so that's sort of what it was born out of. This idea of giving people a way to take a stand and use their voices and their power and get on the web. It's a lot of digital activism, which um, can be super accessible, but definitely um, lots of events. We have articles, videos you can watch, podcasts you can listen to, and everything in between. Um, but my favorite section by far is checked off the list, which is the section all about um, the great accomplishments we've made in the past two weeks. So we've got a newsletter coming out on Friday, so there's still time to subscribe if you want to. Um, again, that's the unitedstatewomen.org backslash newsletter. Um, commercial over, plug over. We're very excited <laughs> about it. It's one of my favorite projects that the United States of Women does. Um, I write it with a little my little team, um, Jocelyn and Jaqueta, and we're really proud to bring it to everybody every week. Yeah, it's so incredible. I learned so much every week, every other week from reading it um, and from talking to Ruthie and Jocelyn and Jaqueta about what they're finding on the internet. The other thing we'll say is if you have an event, if you have something you've seen that's been happening, some issue you wanna talk about, send it to women at civicnation.org. Um, there's so much great stuff, but um, there are only three Ruthie, Jocelyn and Jaqueta's to scour the internet. So um, if you have those tips, we'd love to have them. We'd love to share your information. 
and get all of the great work you're doing out into the world. So that's one of the big things you can do at the United States of Women, um, and we're really excited about that. Um, also, if you haven't signed up and registered for this event today at the United States of Young Women, go do that on our website just so you can get our updates. You can get all of the follow-up on here. You can get some merch discounts of our favorite merch. Ruthie and her team also work on our merch. So Ruthie, will you tell us a little bit about our cool new merch that we've got out right now? Yes, we're so excited. So um, right off the bat, I'll Right off the bat, I'll tell you that we have a special discount code exclusive to um, the attendees of the United States of Young Women. If you use code USOYW at checkout, you'll get 10% off our pronoun socks, which we're really excited about. Um, we think that you should be able to um, wear your style on your sleeve, and that is from head to toe, hence the socks. So um, they have different pronouns, she, her, they, them, and he, him. Um, we think that it's important to no normalize sharing your pronouns and being respectful of people who may use different pronouns than you expect. And um, it's important to respect that those are their pronouns. And so we thought that this would be a fun way to share them. They're really pretty. I'm sure you've seen it. Well, I think so. If you've seen them popping up <laughs> on screen, bright pink and bright blue, um, which, you know, those aren't, we can't gender binary colors. So pink and blue for all. Um, and yeah, check out our shop. It's shop.theunitedstateofwomen.org. You'll see a lot of fun goodies in there, but um, our socks are what's new and on deck and we hope that you'll, you'll strut your stuff in them. That's awesome. Um, I love the pronoun socks. I wear them all the time. Um, they're and cozy. I will say, they're super cozy. They're really cozy. I will say that all of the proceeds for everything on our shop goes directly back to our work that we do here. And so right. um, directly back to programming like this helps us put on this incredible United States of Young Women Summit, um, helps Ruthie and her team write the feminist to-do list, um, helps us build our big summits, also helps us build our gender equity voting collaborative that our colleague Morgan runs, um, which you, we're gonna be talking a lot about tomorrow because tomorrow is all about voting. And we are so excited to have some very, very special guests um, with us tomorrow. So um, we'll, we'll give you a little sneak peek. We have Lexi Underwood joining us, who's this incredible woman uh, um, activist who uh, just started the Voices of Generation Z, but is also a stars in Little Fires Everywhere. We have a couple other special guests, Hannah Bronfman and um, all sorts of other incredible people. And our friends who are talking about how you can get involved in voting whether you are still um, under 18 and can't vote yet, but there's so many ways you can get involved or you can get all of your friends to register to vote if you're over 18. So we're really excited about that tomorrow. And I wanted to ask you, Ruthie, as we're talking about this right now, why is voting so important to you? I don't, I don't know if my answer is boring or not, but I do have um, a very specific <laughs> one that um, I was unable to vote for. I was right on the cusp for a presidential election. I can't remember which year it was because time flies when you're not in high school anymore. Um, I wish <laughs> though, <laughs> um, so, but I, I missed it. And so I felt like, gosh, I, I have strong opinions <laughs> that um, yeah. I wish I could voice um, in a meaningful way. And as we're learning, you don't need to vote to use your voice. And that's what I've learned drawing back on the newsletter. There are so many ways to take action, but um, voting is important to me because it feels like a very concrete way that I can mark it down. There's a record, you know, it's, and it's our civic duty. It's a duty that we all have. I just voted in my um, Texas primary. There's a runoff in my state, which is always yeah. very interesting. And so I was able to vote um, in my district. And it was one of the first times I was able to just because of how elections sort of line up. Um, but it was very exciting. It's exciting and you feel like you're doing, you know, you're, you're, you're responsible for showing up, going to the polls, but there's power in, in your vote, there really is. And you can see the change. And um, if you get really involved, we're lucky to be sort of super involved in the voting area. It's fun to track the results of the election, um, any election. So um, short answer is I missed my big chance to vote and I was so close. And so that's why I'm <laughs> always excited to vote, vote now. And I don't think I'm never gonna miss an election for as long as I live. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. try no matter where I am. No, I totally agree. Voting is so important to me because, you know, as we talk about all of these issues as related to gender equity and related to young women's rights and um, especially related also to LGBTQ rights right now, um, there's so much 
that our elected officials have control over. And we want to make sure that our voice is being used um, in the right way. And we want to make sure that our voice is being represented in every election. So from school board to president, um, it's really totally. important that you vote in every election. And so that's why um, we're so excited to have our fabulous, uh, fabulous programs associate Morgan Johnson running our, our show tomorrow, um, who really runs our gender equity voting collaborative, which you can all get involved with. We've got about 25 different amazing organizations that are a part of that collaborative that are working together to get as many women registered to vote as possible before, um, before the November elections. And also really make sure, making sure that right now, as we're all home, staying safe, keeping our community safe, that we can also vote safely from home as well. And that is so incredibly important for us to make sure it's happening. So check us out tomorrow also. Um, there are also so many more exciting things happening today, a really great health panel, um, some more exciting work that um, so many of our great friends are doing this afternoon. Um, but I also wanna let you know, um, breaking right now here, that the fabulous Amanda Stenberg will be joining us tomorrow live. Um, I know they're in, um, they're out of the country right now, but are going to be joining us live um, tomorrow during uh, during that during what will be our couch party tomorrow, where people uh, can text to make sure all of their friends are registered to vote. So we're really excited about that tomorrow. So not to you know uh, talk too much about tomorrow because we still got today. So Ruthie, what are our housekeeping notes for today? So I am so excited um, about what's up next for us. I'm introducing um, From Self-Care to Healthcare, Barriers to Health for Young Women of Color, which is a fireside chat with Dr. Candace Nicole Hargons and Trinity Johnson. Dr. Candace Nicole Hargons is a counseling psychologist, the assistant professor of counseling psychology at the University of Kentucky, and the founding director of the Center for Healing Racial Trauma. Trinity is an NPH PhD student and is the program manager for Eureka and team leadership for Girls Inc. of Central Alabama. So please enjoy what I know will be a very powerful conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Ruthie. Thanks, everyone. It's nice to finally see you. <laughs> All right. It's been very interesting virtually. Um, so it looks like we can go ahead and get the conversation started. Okay. All right. Well, I am just happy to be here because your work is dope and I can't wait to hear more about it. So. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really excited too to have this conversation. So I can go ahead and give a little bit about my background mm -hmm. um, and how I ended up in medical anthropology. So um, I grew up in lower Alabama um, in the sticks <laughs> um, and I have my master's of public health. Um, I went to Stetson University and Rollins College that are both in the central uh, Florida area. Mm -hmm. And um, during my master's, I was able to do a study abroad program for, it was a really short one in uh, Switzerland. And we read the book, Mountains Beyond Mountains by Dr. Paul Farmer. Um, and I read it and I was like, medical anthropology sounds like a, this is what I'm supposed to do. We also visited the World Health Organization and Ooh. they were like, yeah, we need some anthropologists. And I was like, all right. <laughs> um, and, and some that look like you. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I, um, I'm now a, going into my second year at the University of Central Florida in my PhD program studying medical anthropology. And my specific focus is in maternal health access for black women in rural America. Um, this specific niche for rural America um, kind of came from the fact that once I started, my cousin who I grew up with, who's like a sister was pregnant and I was asking her questions and she was just talking about how long her drive was to get to her OBGYN. And uh, that was kind of the catalyst for my current research. So uh, that's a little bit about my background. How about you, Dr. Well, Argens? Listen, <laughs> I'm gonna keep the, short, the story short and sweet. So I am from a small town outside of Niagara Falls called Lockport, New York. So certainly rural America, even though when people say New York, they don't think rural America. No. <laughs> um, the subsidized housing projects of Lockport, New York. And we moved around quite a bit as a family. And so when I graduated from high school, I was living in suburban Georgia. And to be able to see 
the rural and suburban. And then I went to school at Spelman College in Atlanta. So <laughs> seeing the rural, the suburban and the urban landscapes really gave me a framework for how to flex and talk to people in different environments, how to connect, how to understand race and class and gender. And then Spelman gave me the language. So I observed the experiences, lived the experiences, but Spelman was the first place as a college for black women that said, here's what you call that. And here's an, an analytical tool for you to deconstruct that. Right. And here's some skills for you to dismantle <laughs> that. And I was like, yes. yes. <laughs> I, I knew I wanted to be a psychologist since I was 16. I took a psychology class. But then when I got to college, someone was like, you know, black people don't really see psychologists. And I was like, oh, I guess I'll go into education because I know I can affect change there. But then my classes turned into group therapy anyway. And so it was like, you really need to go pursue your dreams. So I did. And I know now we're in an era where we're seeing more Black people in particular, more people of color broadly go into therapy. There are a lot more public figures who are psychologists. And I love this work. And so that's one part of it. I'm at the University of Kentucky on faculty in counseling psychology. And so I teach people how to be psychologists. I get to practice psychology, but I also do research. So my research is on healing racial trauma. And my research is also on sex and sexual pleasure among people of color. So two things that people struggle to talk about, racism, right. <laughs> sex, I'm on it. And I direct the Center for Healing Racial Trauma. It's really interesting thinking about education and how many... Um, so many Black women in the professional world outside of education, I feel like we started in education. Because yes. I used to, I taught seventh and eighth grade in Orlando what? in the community of Pine Hills. And it was amazing. I love my babies. Um, and See, now- I had a totally different experience. <laughs> I taught high school for three years, hated it, but I love my students. You that's, know what I mean? Like that's, that's yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> That's, yeah, I love my babies. I'm very specific about loving my babies. <laughs> um, I am with Girls Inc. of Central Alabama now working with uh, their, the teen leadership in Eureka a Teen Achievement. So we work with STEM, uh, STEM programs and empowering girls to stay in STEM. Um, and it's mm -hmm. really amazing to be able to still be able to like in the field, but also working with kids because, you know, my babies, they yes. get to work with that age group. Um, so I always love to hear how many of us really started in the in education because mm -hmm. it's it's really interesting. And we still go back to it. We find a way, even yeah. with the work that we're doing that is not in that education to be with Absolutely. Them. I don't know if you've heard of this organization. It's out of Lexington. There's a dope Black woman. Her name is Dr. Cagney Coomer. And she started Nerd Squad. And it's about empowering mm. girls of color in STEM. So I don't know if y'all are in relationship. But if not, please do. because that I will is definitely be connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, too, just about... Um, like making sure we're empowering girls. I just read the book Push Out. Oh, and how was yeah, it? it was amazing. It was so good. Read it. Um, and something that she talked about at the very beginning is how black girls had this, they had two choices and that was to either be really good mm. or they were criminalized. And then I thought growing up, I was just like, oh, that's why I had all of this anxiety related to schoolwork because I needed to be really great. And I think that really ties into this idea of like, what does that help look like for black girls specifically of how, one, how are we represented and how are people looking at us in schools, mm -hmm. but also um, like, what is, what are those access points for us and black girls, you know, I guess I'm a woman now, but <laughs> thinking of how, we're representing them and, and being there for them, uh, specific, especially for counseling, because the school that I taught at, it, there was no, there was one counselor for the entire school and Same. she wasn't there every day. Same. And I think that that draws us into the next question really nicely about like in the wake of COVID and it's proportionately impacting communities of color, especially black people. Why is it important to promote and center black mental health? And for women of girls, how do we do that? And so for me, like I said, my classes became group therapy. So sometimes when you're a psychologist, you are a therapist before you ever get the training because that's right. how your family system <laughs> laid it on out there. But you know, just giving black girls space 
to talk about their lives without minimizing or silencing or dehumanizing or pathologizing them. So I don't take a pathological approach to my, it's like, I just want to hear from you. Mm. And they might say some things where people are like, oh, she's doing this or she's being mean or she's being fast or all of these. I never put a pathological lens on it. It was like, well, how did we get here? Tell me how we got here. Where do you actually want to be? Is this it or is this not it? And so making the entry points in a school system where most girls are going to have to pass through, certainly as a inter instead of the push out as a, a, a holding in, creating a holding space for. But I like the way people in in social media right now on Instagram, like therapy for black girls and yeah. on Facebook, like the way they're using these public easily accessible resources of social media to share how to find a therapist and some therapeutic techniques to reduce your stress and how to talk about black mothers and being a mom and health disparities and all of this, making what we learn in the academy accessible. Yeah. That's why we do it. I always say this, this idea um, and within the, within academia, it's very common for us uh, to write papers and mm. it's this echo chamber. <laughs> yes. um, I, don't believe in that at all. Um, I think that it's important to make sure the information is always digestible. And you brought up this uh, this concept of pathologizing Black girls and Black women, and, and it's so important within my work specifically, especially for reproductive health care access. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of weathering. Yes. And mm -hmm. there's this shift almost to shift from weathering to um, thinking of the sojourner complex. So it, it, it's oh, that's a new it. one for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's this idea that unfortunately with weathering, when you're reading the theory, it's this idea where it is social determinants of health, right? Mm -hmm. And this concept of social determinants of health is a great starting point. But unfortunately, what happens is that it puts a lot of blame on the actual population. Yeah. So for example, I'm a black woman and I don't have three to four times increased risk of maternal mortality because I'm a black woman. That's right. My identity is not my fault. The issue is the actual system that exists, yes. right? So the, there has to be a shift in the conversation from pathologizing the identity of communities, specifically marginalized communities, because it's almost a cop out mm -hmm. when we are talking about what needs to happen. So instead of saying, oh, this is a social determinant of health or you are at risk, like for COVID, black communities are being disproportionately affected by it. And it's because of underlying conditions. And when we are pathologizing it, we're, we're saying, well, black people have diabetes. What mm -hmm. we're not actually addressing is the fact that black people are living in food deserts. Yes. What we're not addressing is that they're living in obesogenic environments that don't have walkable sidewalks, right? So when we're having the conversation about uh, how we're uh, about health access and health equity, we really have to move away from the pathologizing of black or of black and brown communities yes. because then we can now center the problem and the problem is a system that exists. It yes. is not me being black doesn't make me unhealthy, right? It's the fact that the, the persistent racism that exists within the system or within, you know, the sociopolitical, socioeconomic framework of the country, yep. that is what makes it makes me more at risk for all of these other, you know, health, underlying health effects that make are being exacerbated by COVID-19. Um, yes. And then even thinking about once, and I think that we're going to talk about this a little bit, like into the, further into the conversation about health access, right? Mm -hmm. So my research is for rural America, right? That's why I'm in Alabama now, and it's real or back in Alabama, and and this also goes into that conversation of education. So the town that I grew up in in Lower Alabama, once they close schools down, instead of switching to, or the, so the community that I taught in, all the students had computers, right? Okay, okay. In lower Alabama, they didn't provide computers to all the students. So they gave them packets. So we have to think about what does that access point look like? Because if we're switching to telehealth and if we're, yes. we're switching to remote learning, that now means that internet access 
is a right like that is a right to free education Mm -hmm. for telehealth services because if you can't access those things you can't expect people to to do anything right to be able Uh, to learn to get the health care resources they need any of it Mm -hmm. right and how do we how do we go go with that so i'm thinking about it from the mental health piece we're talking about access we're talking about where the providers even live or want to live and then how much providers charge to for for mental health professionals some of us take insurance some of us don't take insurance i use the center for healing racial trauma to work on a sliding scale so that we never have to turn a person of color away for inability to pay and let the consultation work in the white organizations who want anti-racist training subsidize that because that's equitably distributing resources back into healthcare. We have to think about new models of how we pay, how we, some ethics codes don't even allow for barter, but barter is a typical cultural practice. Like if somebody wants to retwist these locks and get some therapy, uh... why not? (laughs) (laughs) There's a lot to it, but I think there's so many ways. I mean, the language we use can be distancing all of that. Right. And then thinking about just like with in there has to be a turnover of the system that we have. So we, people have insurance to pay for health. It's still wild to me that to pay for these braces, I had mm. to get a different type of insurance. Like it wasn't wow. a part of my body, right? <laughs> like to get my glasses, I had to get a different insurance. Like it wasn't a part of my body. The same thing with mental health, the fact that it's not included in all insurance plans. And then when it is included, it's it becomes inaccessible because insurance companies make it so difficult to cover mental health services. And that's not on the fault of mental health providers. That's on the fault of the system that exists. Absolutely. So we've got the insurance system, which is a point of intervention. We have the way communities are organized, organized, which is a point of intervention. We've got education and access to resources, virtual learning, remote learning, all of those which are points of intervention. These are, when everybody asks what to do, these are the things that you can do. These are the things that you can sponsor. These are the things that you can empower and champion in your communities. So I love doing stuff locally. Like local work is the work. And then Mm -hmm. if you get a national presence or if you get an international presence, cool, you just are giving more of a platform to the local work that needs to be done. Right, and and I think one of the things that I'm thinking about locally is, so for black maternal health, oftentimes when we have this conversation, unfortunately, it's really centered in like bigger cities. Yes. And then we have this conversation about rural health, it's centered in the, the white American experience in rural America. Mm-hmm. And it completely erases the an entire demographic of women who live in rural America. And the wildest part of that is over about, according to the 2010 census, now we're having a new one come out this year. So hopefully everybody's filling it out. But thinking about the fact that over half of the black American population live in the South. Mm -hmm. So when we're having these conversations about access in black women and black reproductive health, and we don't talk about specifically Black rural women, mm. most Black American women are now left out, left out of that conversation. Yes. Um, and in that, I think that's why it's so important. And uh, there, there's a question here of why is it important to promote and center uh, Black voices, specifically Black women and Black girls' voices? It's because the people who are creating their stories or p- putting their stories on like a platform are often not representative of how diverse and not like once I taught I taught in Orlando so my school was about 97 percent black mm-hmm. but it was so diverse because yes. like we had black people from all over the world my students were Caribbean West African African American uh, Latinx and that was the moment that, and then my experience with Stetson University, which is also, it's in Deland, Florida, it taught me that blackness is not monolithic. Cause growing yes. up in Alabama, the only black folks that existed were black Americans, mm-hmm. right? Like the only people that I interacted with who looked like me came from backgrounds like me. 
And it's so important to center those voices because once we, we're, if we're not centering those voices, we're framing the story for them yeah. without actually thinking about how diverse those communities are, right? Mm-hmm. We're um, talking about socioeconomic diversity, ethnic diversity, sexual identity diversity, gender right. identity diversity, age exactly. diversity, body diversity. All of those pieces are in our communities. I saw that was my introduction to it was at Spelman. We're seeing, for, for me, the first time in my life, seeing very, very wealthy Black people. <laughs> and yeah. you're like, this exists! <laughs> because that was just, other than the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, that was really written out of my experience. And it wasn't my personal experience. And seeing people from the Caribbean was a part of my life. But then seeing people who were from immediate African descent in a variety of countries in Africa, learning that history even was like, I'd never been exposed to this K through 12. So absolutely right. centering yeah. Black voices comprehensively. And there was a question about how this ties into the SCOTUS ruling on birth control access, which I know you are into maternal and we, I do sex. And so in the intersection of that is reproductive health right. and how that applies to women and girls and what the message we're getting from those rulings are. I think um, one I'll just think as far as the organization that I work for, for Girls Inc., we do a lot of uh, work in advocating for different uh, policies that are beneficial to women as far as it comes to like reproductive health care. There's a campaign called Free the Pill campaign that we support Mm -hmm. as an organization. Um, And it's this idea, it's this, this campaign for uh, the fact that birth control should be something that is accessible over the counter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, when I was an undergrad, I was a uh, pharmacy technician, and I remember so many times that my manager would try to put Plan B behind the counter, and I was like, "That's illegal! You can't, mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't do that." Um, and also thinking about access to reproductive care, so. As, as an organization, we know that, you know, we, we deserve the knowledge and resources and yes. reproductive health care doesn't necessarily just mean actually going to a doctor. That means mm-hmm. like educate sex education. That means <laughs> education that is, can include absence, but that's not, that shouldn't be the only mm-hmm. um, option and comprehensive and yes. racist, yes. gender flexible. <laughs> accessible sex ed, like right. sex positive sex ed. We don't talk about pleasure. And so when we think about birth control and rulings on that, when we think about that, it's all because people are still coming from this mindset that sex is for conception and conception only, especially when they think about girls and women. Mm-hmm. And if you wanna expand that definition, there's such a threat to this idea of like who womanhood should be or what a girl is supposed to be doing at her, you know, in her adolescence. And it totally misses that there's sexual desire there and pleasure there and exploration there. And all of those are normal. And I think if sex ed doesn't begin to talk about the full spectrum of what's available to us, and if it doesn't give us access to all of the modalities of contraception that are available to us. And if we don't think about it comprehensively, we're missing out on an opportunity for people to enjoy themselves, but also for people to be truly healthy in the way the World Health Organization says sex, sexual health should be. What our reproductive rights are. What? <laughs> um, and also thinking about, and I, I never lead this type of conversation with this point, but this is a very important point to include, right? Is this, I the, the fact that birth control isn't just for birth control, mm-hmm. right? It's this, it's this, these rulings are taking away necessary care from women in, or from people who need from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's such a, there's such a l- overarching larger issue because of the way that we have essentially demonize the idea of sex where it's if you are on birth control then you are having sex right Right. and you might be that's okay (laughs) but the just making sure those things that are accessible um and how there are so many different um like there are so many other healthcare Mm -hmm. 
things that birth control can address and that has now been taken away from anyone who needs to take it. Absolutely. So the next question, and I don't know how you want to approach this is about the spike in COVID cases in the U.S. and how social media is broadcasting <laughs> this. What do you recommend for protecting mental and physical health during this pandemic? I can talk about mental health, but I don't know if this is the wheelhouse you roll in. This is not really my area, so I can so just talk about the mental health pieces. I can speak one from my public health background and then two from the fact that I just got over COVID. No. Um, it's not fun. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> so wearing a mask is important. And I think that there, there's this idea that if, if you're wearing a mask, then why are you worried? But if I was wearing a mask, I wouldn't be worried because I would be protected, but that's not what's happening. The, the mask is to protect everyone else from you. So when you're not wearing a mask, you're not putting my life at danger, in danger, right? When I'm wearing a mask, I am protecting everyone from whatever it is that I'm breathing out. And I think that is where that confusion is coming in of why, like there's that, that debate or the conversation about it, but it is so important that we understand that the reason we're wearing masks is to protect others. Mm. If it was to just protect yourself, we, I'm, public health officials would be like, okay, do what you want you. to do. <laughs> like, do. Do what it is that you want to. And and the spikes in Black communities, I've said this so many times, is that COVID has exacerbated nearly every single social justice, social issue in this country, right? Whether that's access to healthcare, whether that's how doctors are treating Black mothers in indigenous mothers in the hospital, because we're finding that since COVID, there are mothers who are being um, like leaving the hospital after birth within 24 to 48 hours, which isn't normal. And they're doing that after C-sections, yeah. right? Like, and yep. I think people forget that C-sections are like major surgery. Major surgery. <laughs> um, like, you tell about it. <laughs> right. So there, this this virus is exacerbating. Every, it's bringing to surface every issue, right? The reason that we have these racial uprisings and we're seeing what's happening is because people, they don't have anything else to do but to pay attention, right? Mm -hmm. If it, the, the murder of George Floyd happened right after they opened up, yeah. right? Right after they opened up. And it's just this idea of like, we have to care about our people because if we don't care about our people, this is going to continue to happen. Yeah. Um, and so that's I like, wanna, let me jump yeah, in ahead. right there with the, with the mental health piece because seeing this is stressful. And that ties into the next question about racial trauma and how all of this goes together. The American Psychological Association called this a double pandemic, where we have racism as a pandemic of its own that has been going on for generations. And then we have COVID as a pandemic. So for Black people, we're under the force of both of those. But then you have, in many of these jobs that were essential work, um, we had more Black people and Latinx people represented in those professions. And so that means you weren't able to just say, I'll work from home. That means mm -hmm. you still had to be. And I, my family is full of essential workers. So people who work at Walmart, people who work in grocery store factories, people who are having to be at work every day for extended hours because of this crisis and being exposed. And then families living in multi-generational households, which is an economic at like an economic opportunity for a lot of families in, a, in the face of racist social policy. And so to have a great grandmother and a grandmother and a um, mother and a child in a home is useful and beneficial socially, but it also does expose and exacerbate the risk. So the mental health pieces of that are just the stress of seeing people die, that grief, that loss people in your family system, maybe you're not able to go to their funerals. That's happened twice in my family so far just this year. But also, you know, this the stress of having to work extra, of knowing that the people that you're closest to are out there putting themselves on the line every day. And the racial trauma piece just expounds and capitalizes on all of that additional stress. So we see people feeling ill, they're, they're 
their digestive systems have changes, their body feels more tense, they're getting headaches and migraines more often, and people are just feeling depressed, feeling anxious much more than they have been. So those are some of the mental health consequences of that. And then I know we're running out. Right. I was going to go to that last question of what uh, gives us drive to fight for Mm -hmm. gender and health equity, um, especially during the times of uncertainty and fear. And then how do we imagine a more equitable world? So I think that once again, um, just centering the voices of Black women, specifically within the context of the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. If we're able to center the voices of Black women, it offers the opportunity to really look at Black and Indigenous women specifically. Mm -hmm. It offers the opportunity to look at so many issues that have existed in this country for generations upon generations. And we're able to see, um, we're able to see the drive, right? Because there's this idea that we are resilient and we have to be um, strong strong and strong Black women, right? Mm -hmm. And there's benefit in that and being able to, to ask people, how did you do it? And then we can use that information to say, okay, well, what can we do to make sure they don't have to do that? Yes. Like, what is it that we're doing? We're making sure that we're asking communities and not assuming what communities need. I love that, asking the communities. I'm a qualitative researcher too, so that is just my jam, to talk (laughs) to people, to hear their lived experiences, and then to write the papers and the research based on that. But the vision, my vision for the world is one where education is critically conscious, honest and accessible for Mm -hmm. everyone so that there's not just one story being told, there are multiple stories and perspectives being told and that it's really deconstructing this idea of what we have come to know the United States as. I want healthcare for everyone. I want uh, public safety and not policing. I want neighborhoods to know each other and to connect with each other. I want mental health facilities in subsidized housing projects and in neighborhood barbershops and hair salons and accessible everywhere. I want health resources to be equitably equitably distributed. And I want love all around. I want us to see each other as human, to talk to each other as human, to set policy for other humans and for our leaders to represent the landscape of the United States and not just a small segment. It's just time for us to see a diversity of leadership styles and hues and structures and people And so that's the world I'm envisioning and the world I'm working for all under this intersectional anti-racist lens. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that's it for us, but I I think think it is. so, yeah. (laughs) It was so good talking to you, Dr. It was wonderful talking to you too. And please feel free to stay in contact. I can't wait to say, uh, oh, oh, thank you. (laughs) I I can't wait to say, Hey, Dr. Johnson, when is your time? (laughs) Thank you all for tuning into our conversation. Um, And I think they're going to be moving on to the next segment. Yes. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Hey guys, it's Nia Sue, and I am so excited to be a part of this event today. United State of Young Women. As a young woman myself, I know how important it is to do your part. So I'm super excited to see so many amazing, bright girls out here taking action. I know you guys have had an amazing day full of great events and virtual programming, but it is also important to take a break, get up and get active. So stand up. It doesn't matter where you are. Get up and come with me. (laughs) We're going to start by just you know, raising our heart rate up a little. We're gonna just like jump around a little, like do a little, little step, do a little step, do a little step. We're gonna go here. Turn. And shimmy. And shimmy. Body roll. <laughs> Another step. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you look silly, just get up, get moving, give your mind a little break. Make you into that. Do a little other thing. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you guys.
guys so much for joining in with me. I am so, so, so happy to see so many young girls taking action, tuning in, learning, growing, and getting fired up about changing the world. It's truly heartwarming. And also, I really, really want to stress on you guys and remind you that if you are of age to please register to vote. And if not, please encourage your friends and family to. So make sure you go out and vote. But anyways, thank you guys so much for having me. I love being an ambassador for When We All Vote. I'm very proud to be one. And also have a great rest of your day. Love you. Hi, my name is Temple Lester and I am the 13-year-old creator of the STEM Swag Box. I also created a movement called STEM Girls Swag to help encourage minorities and girls to take an interest in science, technology, engineering, and math. And I have always loved science ever since I can remember. And I remember one summer, I went to a science camp and I just so happened to be the only girl there and one of few minorities at the camp. And the counselors kept calling me their princess and I didn't understand why. I wanted to be a scientist just like every other boy at that camp. And so as I got older, I continued doing research and I found out that there is a huge gap between men and women in science related fields. And I didn't really understand that because girls do just as well as boys on standardized testing in math and science. So the only reason I could think of was because they kept calling us princesses and they don't call us scientists. So what I can do about that is I can do my part. I may not be able to change that, but I can do what I can do. So I created the coolest science kit ever, the STEM Swag Box, and I raised over $5,000 on GoFundMe to help donate my boxes to lower income kids so they can have their own science fund at home. I do workshops, I public speak, I do seminars, and I have probably spoken to over 10,000 people, educators, students, teachers, parents, about the importance of girls in STEM. So I have a call to action for you guys. The next time you see a girl, don't think, hi, cutie, hi, beautiful, hey, diva. Think, hi, astronomer, hi, silver engineer. Hi, zoologist. Hi, biochemist. Hi, anesthesiologist. I would like to thank the United State of Women, and together we can change the world. I am Temple Lester. Hi, my name is Jordan Reeves. I'm 14 years old, and I discovered STEM could take my life in directions I never could have imagined. I've always had to figure things out a little differently because I was born with one hand. Having a disability helped me think creatively, and that's probably why I was able to come up with an idea that brought a lot of joy into the world. It gave me a chance to talk to people like you about the awesome combination of STEM and disabilities. What did I do? Well, I came up with a way to shoot biodegradable glitter with a prosthetic arm. And since then, I've had a chance to launch a nonprofit that helps other kids with disabilities learn how to design and invent. I'm even working on a new digital version of our workshop for kids of all kinds to learn those lessons. What I learned is my experiences give me a different perspective. And when I share my experiences, I could make sure disabled people are included in STEM. We all have different perspectives that can change the world. Once you learn new skills, it's a chance for you to speak up and encourage others to learn from you. From what I've learned, I've had a chance to consult on toys, so now you can see prosthetic leg wearing Barbies in the stores. I've even had the chance to give input on clothing and shoes, and I'm still learning. You can too. Even if something seems scary, give it a try. You might hear the word STEM or STEAM all the time, but give it a try. Those lessons give you the skills to take on new challenges that can help change. And right now, we need a lot of change. We can all be a part of it. Thank you. Welcome. So
so many folks have been talking about the impacts that are happening nationally. And today, in this conversation, we're going to be talking about the local impacts. And because of COVID-19 and all of the uprisings we've seen across the country, the importance of local community action, local activism, local organizing, and local policy making is important now more than ever. So I'm here with Diana Zuniga and Carla Ortiz to have a discussion around the local work. Uh, my name is Yvette Ale. I'm senior policy lead with Dignity and Power Now and the Justice LA Coalition. And all three of us have been involved in organizing and activism from a young age. So I'm really excited to get into this conversation with Diana and Carla. Welcome, both of you. Thanks, Yvette. So excited to be here. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with both of you today and everyone else who's joining us as well. Wonderful. So let's dive right in. Um, I'd love to hear from both of you. Uh, what propelled you into local organizing and local community building? And what has that looked like throughout your, uh, your time as young women and stepping into leadership? Definitely. Um, I think what really propelled me into kind of local community organizing was my um, experience being impacted by incarceration. So a lot of the work that I do is around shifting, um, shifting resources away from incarceration and building more prisons and jails and towards health and human services. At a very young age, I saw my family members, my father specifically, um, being incarcerated from my community and the kind of excessive policing that was happening in specifically black and brown communities. Um, I knew at a very young age, I didn't want to continue seeing that um, impact on my family and continue to see my family being incarcerated. And so I started connecting to local organizations that also had people that were impacted by incarceration. And I felt so empowered and seen by the stories of community members that were very similar to my own story. Um, I think from there, I started really working on direct service, uh, policy change, and recently was able to lead Los Angeles County in developing an alternatives to incarceration roadmap, along with Yvette and so many other community members that have been impacted by incarceration. I think we are winning because the movement is being led by formerly incarcerated people and by their family members. And that's why I feel so fortunate to be a part of the local movement because I know we're going to continue winning. That's right. We, we have been winning and it's really exciting to see the change here in Los Angeles in just a matter of years. But we know this has been decades of work uh, over the course of our lifetimes and, and our loved ones' lifetimes. Uh, Carla, can you speak to the work that you've been doing here in Los Angeles and, and what propelled you into organizing? Yeah, definitely. For me, my work started when I was maybe 15, 16. Um, I like to believe that we are drawn to what feels close to us, right? What feels like home to us. So for me, gender-based violence was so close and so relatively hitting home for me. So when I started working for the East Los Angeles Women's Center, I did a youth leadership training that helped me understand more what gender-based violence was, how to empower myself, how to find my voice. And later throughout the years, I was brought on as a staff and now I'm running program. Now I'm empowering young women to speak their truth and to empower themselves and also to remind themselves that they are worthy of so much more than what the media propels us to be. And along with that work, I'm also doing work with the California Endowment. I'm a, a President's Youth Council member, and we're focusing around health equity for all young people across California. And within that work, I'm part of a subgroup that I focus on working with um, healing youth trauma. Right, and acknowledging that we carry trauma, that it may be ancestral, it may be that it's a lineage that we're carrying, but that we all carry some sort of trauma and working through that and working and finding ways where young people can find their truth, but also heal through the work, right? Because activism is the way that we all tend to heal. For me, doing this work, I was able to kind of begin my healing process and acknowledge that there's work that needs to be done here in LA and across California and across the world, right? 
Because when we begin to see that healing is transformation, we begin to see that there's growth in it all, right? And doing work across California for me is so empowering to see that my story relates to other young women and other young people across the world. So for me, it's empowering to see that I'm just only 21 and I have been able to accomplish so much starting at the age of 15, 16, and knowing that there's other young women out there that are on that same journey, right? That are out there trying to find their voice. And I'm here to let them know that they will find it right but it's a matter of believing in yourself and someone telling them that they believe in them and I'm that person that usually tells our young people that I believe in them and I'm rooting for them to do their thing and to empower themselves as well well both of you started uh, at a young age to to get involved in local organizing uh, what would you tell the young women that are watching this today around like what steps should they take in order to get plugged in. Let's say they, they're really passionate about gender justice or they're really passionate around alternatives to incarceration or healing work. How, how can they take the next step to actually get involved? I mean, I so appreciate Gardla bringing in the healing aspect because I, I totally agree with that. As we do the work that we're, our, our spirits are connected to, we're consistently undoing the harms that were done to our people um, for generations and for lifetimes. And I think one of the things that was really helpful for me was to just listen to myself for one, listen to what brings me joy, what ignites that passion, what makes me excited to talk about. Um, and you know, what also could be difficult to navigate and difficult to move through. I think even in understanding myself a bit more and what my drive and what my fire was helped also call in mentors and individuals that then connected me to all of these different opportunities um, to organize, to build with others, to heal. Um, and so I think those are kind of key steps, listening to yourself, connecting to the people that you admire, that you learn from, asking people to be your mentor. Folks want to do that if they're asked. Um, and even looking to organizations that you really admire the work that they're doing and figuring out if they have any paid internships or volunteer opportunities. Um, paid internships are awesome and sometimes they're out there. You just got to look for them. Um, so I would say some of those things um, were really helpful in my journey um, and continuing to build community. You know, we are being impactful because we've built community with each other. And so as much as you can do that within your networks, um, that's going to be really helpful as you continue to gr grow and continue to propel yourself forward in the spaces around organizing, advocacy, and healing. One thing that you mentioned, Diana, that really stuck out to me is that once you were able to connect with folks that had similar experiences, you didn't feel so alone and you felt so empowered. Can you all, can you both talk more about what it looks like to be in community uh, around an issue and how it uh, replicates and strengthens the work that you all are doing? Carla, do you wanna start? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think to your point event, or to answer that question, when I think of community, I think of we're all in this together, right? Like the high school musical song, we're all in this together, <laughs> but also in La Quech, right? That you are my other me and we are not free until um, everyone is free, right? So for me, community is finding people who have the same mindset, who are there for community, right? Who are pushing forward and thinking about the best interest in what um, the end goal is. And for me, I think that's the best thing that you can ever do is find like-minded people and get to your end goal, right? And like Diana said, it's a matter of us just finding people who are willing to guide us through that journey, that are willing to mentor us. And people are out there, they're ready, they're willing. It's a matter of us oftentimes asking. But I also feel like there's a stigma around us asking for help, asking for somebody to guide us, right? And I think it's important for us to break down those barriers that it's okay for us to ask. We can can't do everything on our own, right? Because that's too much. It would be impossible. We would all get burned out very quickly. And that's why we have community to have people to help us, guide us, and get there and remind us that we're in this together for the long run. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. And the piece that you're saying around like-minded people. Um, a healer this past week shared with me um, that they're starting to also uh, use the words uh, like-hearted and like-spirited. Um, when you find that community that is both like, like-minded, like-hearted, like-spirited, there's this just synergy that's created around being able to move forward together. You all are connected to a common vision that is really rooted in the experiences that you've had as young people, um, as people of color, um, as people that you know, mostly have been like oppressed and marginalized. And that is able to build up into empowerment and shifting the narrative that has been given to us. In this time, that narrative, that system is no longer going to work. And it's going to be, you know, it, it's upon us to really think about how we're in community with each other to keep on pushing back and to keep on actually realizing that vision of community change, community love, community connection that we know is actually going to continue to liberate us. Um, so that is when I think about my community, that's who I think of like minded, like hearted, like spirited, and folks that are just you know, so connected and experience that we're going to keep on pushing in every which way together and protect each other along the process. I love that, Diana. I'm definitely going to take that with me, the like-minded, like-hearted, like-spirited. It's beautiful. Um, and it's that synergy that you talked about that has propelled a lot of the work here in Los Angeles forward to success. Can you talk about what success has looked like, uh, Diana, in terms of the work that you mentioned around alternatives to incarceration here in Los Angeles? Sure. Um, we have been so successful in LA. We uh, have stopped a $3.7 billion jail plan. We have created the Alternatives to Incarceration Roadmap, which has 114 recommendations to support people to get diversion and alternatives instead of jail. Um, we are now talking about closing Men's Central Jail. And you know, we're talking about this through a lens of community solutions. Many of us have been harmed by these systems. Many of us have experienced harm at, at, at the hands of the system. And we are actually thinking about solutions to address those harms, to really think about um, mental health support, substance use support, culturally appropriate support that is led by black and brown people. Um, I think that we're both successful in seeing these external wins of like stopping jail expansion of closing jails, but we're also presenting so many tangible and clear solutions that I think is really going to build a different Los Angeles. Um, and I know Yvette can speak a lot to this, but you know, there, Justice LA is about to put uh, an initiative on the ballot to shift 10% of net county costs into housing and alternatives to incarceration. That is huge when we know that we're in a situation where we're being told that economics isn't going to allow for our visions to be realized. Community is taking information and being creative and shifting that narrative so that we're shifting resources into this alternative vision this alternatives to incarceration vision. So I just feel so proud of this. And I know that there's so much more success as we continue. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you mentioned is key. Not only do we advocate against what we don't want to see in our communities, we are presenting the vision of what we do want to see in our communities. And both are equally important, right? And the solutions are there. And actually, even despite all of the funding setbacks because of COVID, the money is there. There are billions of dollars in our coffers here in Los Angeles that can be better spent on community reinvestment and allowing community to guide that vision all along. Um, Carla, I wanna ask you the same question. What does success look like uh, for you, for Los Angeles? Um, what will success look like in the coming months? Yeah, that's always a tough question, right? In this upcoming months, what does success look like, especially in the times of COVID right now? Mm -hmm. For me, success definitely looks like when doing gender justice, oftentimes for us at our organization, it was only a space for young women 
to come and talk about gender justice, gender-based violence. But in this past year, we were able to shift that and invite young men into the space with us and have conversations around sexual assault, have conversations around consent, have conversations around toxic masculinity, right? And in space with young women. And those are oftentimes very hard conversations to have, right? But we're having these conversations at a much younger age. These um, youth that come in, they're ages 14 to 24. When we're beginning to have these conversations around sexual assault, consent, and healthy relationships, we're breaking down the barrier of toxic masculinity that comes from home, right? When we begin to have conversations, when we, when we talked about the Me Too movement, a lot of these young men came and told us, wait, these are conversations that I'm having at home that are normal. I thought this was okay, mm -hmm. right? But they now come into space and realize this is no longer okay. I need to change the way I talk to young women. I need to change the way that I think about young women, right? And even in this space, we see that these young men are stepping up um, to talk to women and hearing them and actually being allies in space and acknowledging their privilege. To me, success looks like in these upcoming years, having more conversations with young men and young women in the space to being able to hear what's going on and how we can best support each other Right, because I think I always remind them and remind myself that gender is a social construct, right? We've come up with this idea of what gender is. So we now are putting ourselves into these gender expectations and gender roles when we can dismantle them and have authentic, real conversations that are gonna better our future, right? And better end the gender wage gap as well, right? Because when we talk about that, their minds are always blown. So to me, success looks like inviting everyone to the table and having authentic, real, heartfelt conversations. I love that. I, I love the, the intersectionality that we're all discussing today around gender justice, around the impacts of incarceration, around community reinvestment. Um, so we have about two minutes left. So I just wanted to open up to each of you. Um, Carla, if you can just share um, your, your final thoughts uh, and what you want folks to walk away with uh, from this conversation. Yeah, so definitely walking away. I want people to walk away with knowing that they matter. Their voice does matter, right? And sooner or later, they will find their fire. Their fire is within them. It's a matter of somebody igniting that fire, igniting that passion for them to go out and to advocate what they feel is good and whatever it feels close to their hearts as well. Thank you. Diana? Um, you are powerful you are so powerful. And even when people tell you no, even when people tell you that you can't do something, even when people try to doubt you, do not take that in. You are made of magic and your ancestors dreamed of you being created. And you are here in this moment to make the change that we all so desperately need. Your spirit is here in this moment to make that change. And so please, I think, likely all of us on the panel heard no many times and we did not take it because we know we are powerful beings that are going to continue to shift the narrative continue to shift resources and continue to shift this world into something that is actually going to care about us um so i appreciate you all and i'm excited to hear about all of the things that you will do as that fire ignites thank you both so much and just to reiterate some of the key pieces, find folks that are like-minded, like-hearted, like-spirited, use your activism as part of your healing process, uh, gravitate towards the things you love and are passionate about, and don't take no for an answer, you're magic. Thank you all so much for listening to our conversation and being part of the work in your local communities. And just like that, we are done with day two of the United States of young women. And now we are going to move into our breakouts. So for those of you who received a welcome email from us this morning, if you go back to that, you should see a link to all of the breakouts and you can select your breakout and head straight there. If you are joining us because you just found us today, thank you. And feel free to head to our website, the United State of Women backslash youth and for those of you who are watching on YouTube or Facebook, we will drop that link in the comments now so you can head over there. For those of you who are watching it on our site, you're ahead of the game. And just scroll down to the breakout section and you'll see all of our day two breakout sections have a button that says 
join this breakout. So you'll want to click on that. That'll take you directly there. It's a pink button. And then it will ask you to register again. If you already registered, feel free to enter that in again. It's just to make sure that we know you have arrived and all of our breakouts will get started by 2.15 p.m. So take a moment, uh, scratch a little bit, grab a drink, uh, a snack if you need it. And all of our fantastic and amazing partners are so excited to meet you in those breakout sections. Thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you back here tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern.